Kia ora. this is the program for my wedding. It was letterpress printed at MOTAT, the Museum of Transport Technology, over the last three months. Let's hear from past me about how we took this from a concept to a finished item. So the design process uh, when coming up with the program had uh, was t quite time consuming, went through a lot of different stages. So I haven't shown all of those, but I'll just show you a summary here. So what so I've just placed down on the stone here. So first thing that we did was I came up with uh, an idea of what I think wanted things to look like. And so like I, I set, I decided uh, that the program was going to be uh, two sheets of paper. So then we had eight possible sides because folded in half because there's eight possible sides to work on and what those would look like and how the layout would be. And um, interestingly, this isn't uh, too different to uh, what we eventually ended up with. But then this is also what we what we did, and this was many years ago, maybe three or four years ago, when it was first decided that we were gonna actually do the whole getting married thing. Uh, and a lovely Makayla, uh, here in, in the print shop uh, pulled out some ornaments and some little designs so you can get an idea of uh, what we wanted to to do and so they, these are all just some little test prints just to see what blocks do because it's not always obvious when you look at a block so for example this one here looked very much like a bell uh, on the block but once we printed it we can see it's a hammer and chisel so um, we're not 100% but we're fairly sure that's a masonic symbol um, and doesn't really look all that bell-like um, after all um, but having an idea of what kind of font we might like to work with and so this is the Liberty Script 48 point which is what we ended up going with and here are some lovely little borders that we thought about using but didn't um, other border pieces little ornaments there and then once we came up with uh, with the design I mocked it up um, just on the computer so I came out with some different versions you can see we've gone through at time of filming seven versions here uh, on different dates with different things added or subtracted um, some of them are being marked up more than others see here's one of the first days where we were going through in the print shop and really thought about how things were going to look um, changing words changing layout um, changing what's been capitalized and not what stage things are up at what ornaments we're going to think about putting in and uh, and then noting things that uh, slightly that I need to check you know check spelling uh, and this will continue so once we start doing the, the printing they'll be going through this again where we except where we're using the print actual uh, letterpress print off the Platten Heidelberg over there and uh, then going through and finding mistakes finding things that need to change not necessarily always mistakes just things that haven't printed well or or that doesn't make sense once you're looking through the print of course once that has all been set it then ends up in the drawer and so we've got here all tied up ready to go that is uh, him, this one here is the hymn page for all things bright and beautiful it's from the cover there um, Bernie and Scott there in the date of the mayor of the wedding so the list of people who have been involved in the, the greeting and the list of people involved in their jobs and some of the ornaments waiting to be used and then in this one we have this drawer don't drop it on the floor don't drop it on the floor uh, what do we have here we have uh, the colophon and the music credits because being a printer I want a colophon being a being working for a university I want proper um, citations there uh, this is the order of service just changed a few times there this is another page oh this is the the hymn be thou my vision and this is the order of events over the day uh, starting with what day what what time the church opens and the prelude music all the way down to what time the the reception begins now of course an important decision when you're printing is to think about not only what colors do you want to do but also what font you're going to use and because when you're setting it by hand you can't just click a little button to change the font you've got to manually set it so the trick is to try and figure that out before you start fortunately here at Motet we have dun, 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 the pro the the font catalog Sadly, these aren't in any particular order. They were just as they fitted, and you've got my notes that have stuck in the pages over the years. So we've got um, times on this page, grotesque, Garamond. Now we use a lot of Garamond here, partly because we have a lot, and because it's a nice font. Um, we particularly have a lot of the size uh, 14 Gar Garamond, uh, which is the workhorse in the print shop, 
and that's what I've used as well and we chose we I wanted an art script for the fancy bits and so we went with Liberty partly because it has the mo we have the most uh, letters and there's nothing worse than getting writing then setting and then running out of letters there are a few others that are very lovely the palace is nice but it's just too small that's 18 and it's that small uh, the art deco is lovely but look how massive that is there's no <laughs> you'd run out of paper before you run out of words um, and a few others that are similar like that the shadow is quite nice and Florentine is very lovely look at look at that but uh, a bit much for to be writing for a while so yes went through and decided that we would go with the Garamond and the Liberty and you'll see me do some setting in a moment another thing to think about is what kind of paper that you're going to use when you're printing so I'm not an expert in this I'm still new to printing and I'm not very much of an artist myself at least not yet uh, so I called on the expertise of one of the print shop volunteers here Michaela Curtis who's an artist and a poet um, and who has a lot more expertise in, the, in these so we decided uh, to go for an off-white and recommended 135 to 150 uh, grams per square meter uh, so that means it's a little bit stiffer than like your printer paper which is around 80 uh, GSM uh, but not so stiff as card uh, which would make it sort of harder to fold and a bit awkward when you're using it so finding that balance is, is really important so I went up to Gordon Harris the art shop and uh, in the camera these look all kind of the same so this is a uh, a white white with a texture I'll show that in a second um, and then this is a uh, they call this one mist and this one china white so this one is, very, is faintly yellow this one's faintly brown we decided ultimately to go for this one it has the sort of the, the better balance because uh, we also tested out our colors and so these are the colors that we were thinking about printing on the front page oh, the receipts tucked in there and you can see here the how the colors have come out this is the metallic purple and the metallic green looking across the different papers and so the colors kind of balance the best on this shade of paper this white has a texture it's hard to see um how well you can see that it's got a bit of a texture which makes a problem with printing um and of course that's always a consideration um and you can see that when i did the test print i was in a rush and i over inked and i made a splodgy mess everywhere which was great fun to clean up not um and never mind that in the test my name my last name was spelled wrong well no detail but yes always a consideration and um, I had to specially order this paper uh, so 12 packets and uh, generally they don't have of one particular color uh, <laughs> 12 packets just sitting on the shelf as you can imagine that is uh, a lot of work and it's taken me many weeks uh, but uh, you'll see more in the time lapses and some of the other vignettes that are coming in a second well now that we have decided what we're going to do the next step is to actually assemble it and uh, composite it together so we start with our uh, trusty compositing stick our comp stick um, and so I'm going to start by putting a riglet in and I already know how wide it needs to be which is going to go for 25 across uh, and then we actually the next thing we do is we pull out the drawer of what we're working on in this case it is four, the 14 Garamond italic which is just here Pull it up onto the workbench. Drop the pop stick in the process. We'll just bring it down so you can see what I'm working on. Fortunately, we've got a rubber mat here, so that's not the end of the world. And then we start assembling our words. So I know that my first word here is chorus. So I've got a C H O. Uh, you and of course over time you memorize where everything is but I do have a cheat sheet should I need it and I don't know how well you can see that but um, the word is not only upside down but back to front and you get very used to reading that and that is of course because when it goes on the page it is going to be the right way up and we write it backwards so that we spell it the correct way because otherwise I would have had to write S-U-R-O-C uh, S-U-R-O-H-C which is a lot harder to spell than doing it this way so we work that way and when it prints it comes out the right way so here is a type draw you can see this is the size 14 Garamond uh, and in this case it's regular we also have it in bold and italics um, now we've done a lot of I've already done a lot of the setting by the time I took this video so you can see we've used up uh, a lot of that uh, so but on this side we have 
the lower case and here we have the upper case. So in the in the original days these would have been separate cases and we would have had one above it, another, and so that's how we get the idea the names of uppercase and lowercase. So for example, uh, here will be a capital P. Uh, if that's in focus. We go and over here somewhere will be a lowercase p. Um, and so you just get an idea of, you eventually memorize where they are, but I'll, uh, here is a layout of what the cases look like. We have a couple of different cases, styles here. We have California, or the New Zealand version of a California case, and we have the New Zealand Print Museum case. Um, the all of the type has been donated to Motat, and we've kept them in the layout that uh, they had when they, when they came. In just a moment, I'm going to get on with setting the colophon. Uh, this is where we record down what uh, type we used, where we did the printing, uh, who was involved, and I'm also going to list all the music credits there. For that, that's going to involve three different type cases. It's also Garamond 14, but I'm going to be using bold, regular, and italics. And because of the way that letterpress works, that means three different drawers. So I'm going to have the regular and the italic up here on the bench with me, and I'll pull the uh, the bold out of the drawer as I need it. We're going to switch back to a time lapse. As you can probably imagine, this is arguably the most time consuming part of doing letterpress. The actual printing is over and done with in a couple of hours, but setting all of the text took me the best part of two or three months and I was in at Motat twice a week I was there every Sunday and I took every Wednesday off work to go in and work more on the text um, it just takes a long time but um, that's part of the process that's not to say that comping isn't a fun part of the process uh, you get really in the zone it becomes quite meditative um, you probably can't see here but um, I'm playing some music on my phone I'm making sure that I'm hydrated and I'm standing on a rubber pad which helps with the uh, tired legs after standing on concrete all day um, and so it's really quite lovely feeling
Here I'm using a gauge to work out my spacing and make sure that um, where there are gaps, there are, they are consistent on each line. In hindsight, there was an easy way to do that. I could have broken the block of text up into smaller blocks, and then all I would have had to do is space each block rather than trying to space every line against every other line. But I managed to make it work, and uh, it's something that I've learned for the future. As I filled up the comp stick, I would bring sections over onto the stone and use the furniture there to hold the pieces together. And then uh, once you've got a working amount, you uh, put them all down together as a, as a single block. And here I am checking against my piece of paper against the type to make sure that what I've, <laughs> what I've written out is the same as what should be there. And then using some string here to tie up each block. Um, to go in the drawer while we're not using it. Always super important to clean and tidy as you go. Uh, this is for a couple of reasons. One, a clean space is easier to work in, and two, you do share the space with other people. So once you've assembled your block of text, it's time to start on the first round of editing. And of course here we are reading upside down and back to front, uh, but going through and checking that the words are the same, that the letters are up the right way, and that you're not missing any words. At one point in here, I was missing a pretty major word, and I had to re re-space the whole block of text because it's missing such a big word. Other times I realized that uh, I was now going to have to break a line that I'd written over two lines and I didn't want to do that so what I did would do is I'd rewrite the line to use different words so that it would still fit on the same line. Well this is the uh, Motet print shop. We've got some presses here. We've got the cylinder press followed by the platen press, liner type and Ludlow there. We've got uh, cabinets of type machine, more cabinets of type, and these are the particular type uh, that I've been using for this project. Furniture and riglet, we've got another stone down here, and we've got the Arab press here, uh, and the cropper uh, there. And um, so this is where all of the work has happened. Uh, so now we're going to lock the text into the chase here, uh, into the chase to form a form. And uh, so we're going to surround it with riglets and furniture and some coins, which you'll see in greater detail in just a second.
once we're happy with the layout we place the coins in these are expandable joints and we lock them we tighten them gently with a key at first then we use the mallet to make sure that all of the type is level you want to do this just gently and make sure that everything's flat and then you go through the iterative process of gently tightening the coins now this is something that I struggle with a lot and I often have to get someone like Makala to come in and do for me because I have a tendency to over tighten the coins and then I bend the frame and then it doesn't fit in the press uh, makala has got a much better hand at this than I do and the struggle is to make sure that you tighten everything so that it's tight enough that it will go through the machine uh, without any parts falling out. This isn't necessarily as simple as it seems and sometimes the more work you do on a piece the more that a piece keeps falling out and sometimes all you can do is take it all out, um, redo all the spacing, retighten it all up again and try again. Some are obviously more complicated than others. Once we've done that it's time to take a test proof and uh, we might do this on the proofing press like Richard is doing here with a Christmas card. In this case though we were starting to run out of time so we're going straight to the Heidelberg Platin press which is the one that we're doing the full print on. And so here we have Dennis who is the printer for this particular job and he's putting the form into the press here to take a test print. Here, first he tightens it up so that nothing moves while we while we are working he inks up the uh, inks up the text and then he activates the suction arms on the windmill to pull a sheet through for a test so first things first, as a couple of us go through the sheet and identify problems, these are letters that might not have printed or, or things that are incorrect, and a chance to go through and make any edits. Then we pull the form out of the press, clean off the ink, and uh, undo the coins. You see I leave one on the end to tell everyone else that this is not locked and they shouldn't try to lift it. And then, because my fingers are fat, I use tweezers to pull out the offending letters and swap them out for new ones type that is damaged aren't keep these are consumables and so they are biffed every time we make a change or an adjustment we have to repeat the process we need to lock it all up again we need to lift it to make sure that all the pieces are going to hold then it goes over to Dennis he doesn't an, and he does another proof and we repeat this over and over until we're happy with it and that's when we can continue on to the proof but we need to do this also for every single page. In this project I had eight pages over four leaves so that was four different setups that we needed to have and of course each one also had slightly different settings for Dennis to change on the press to make sure that the press was lining up in the best way on the paper. Thank you. We also had to do this for every colour that we used and to make sure that all of the colours were balanced right on the page and that everything was spaced correctly because each uh, colour is a separate pass through the press. The front page had three colours so that means it had to go through the press three times. So the ink reservoir up here comes onto the rollers, the rollers run down over the text and then the printer with its windmill arms puts the paper onto the text and then brings it over and drops it on the pile. Here you can all see it happening in kind of slow motion so we have the rollers taking ink from the reservoir and running it over the text at the same time the windmill arms are picking up a piece of paper from the pile and putting it into the clamshell. The clamshell closes pressing the paper against the wet type. Now this is pressing with tons of force. If you if your hand was in there you would lose your hand. And then as the clamshell opens again the windmill takes the printed sheet and pulls it over onto the pile while the other side of the windmill arm is picking up a new piece of paper. And what you can just see here to the right is there's a little nozzle there and it's just spraying a very fine amount of uh, starch onto each sheet as they come so that the because the ink is quite wet and it takes a couple of days for it to dry and so this stops will help stop the pages from sticking to each other and also transferring wet ink to the back of the previous page 
We were operating the press quite slowly at a, a few hundred copies per hour, uh, but the press can do several thousand copies per hour. So as you can imagine, a print run of only a couple of hundred copies takes a lot more time to set the text than it does to print it. And here is the same process on a different page in a different color happening at normal speed. And you can really see the effect of the windmill arms here. All of this isn't of course to say that printing is super easy and that uh, Dennis here can just sit and forget. As you can see he periodically takes a sheet from the pile and goes through and checks it for a variety of things, making sure that it's inking correctly, that everything is still lined up, that the impression is even, and the impression is how much the type is pressed into the page. If you press in two type too hard you can damage the type um, and you also push through the back of the paper a little bit. This can be done on purpose for a really great effect um, but if you're printing on both sides then you risk uh, a danger there that you're gonna muddy your text so to speak um, and so as you can see Dennis is checking and doing little adjustments as time goes on to uh, make sure that the print is at its best quality. Printing the program happened over a series of different days which would allow time for the ink to dry before you moved on to the next section. At the end of each day and between different colours we would have to completely clean the machine all the way back to nothing and then build up a new colour again. So here Dennis is applying a little bit of the purple ink, you see a little bit goes a long way and then he runs the machine for a bit uh, sort of empty. Um, as, you see, as you see there's no type in there and so he's just running the ink over the rollers to get them nice and even and coated and then um, very quickly we switch over to printing it all takes it all happens very quickly On the last day that we were printing we needed to do two batches quite close together and there was a danger uh, that the ink was going to stick to the previous page. So what Dennis did was he placed a blank sheet of white paper between each sheet that we printed and he turned the impression off on the press so it didn't print on that page but then so printed every second page and to do that he had to manually set that between each page and so this would mean that if the ink did run or did stick to another sheet it was sticking to a sheet of the white scrap paper rather than to another page from the program. Once all the ink had dried we had the idea of also creasing the programs uh, on the Heidelberg by using a creasing block on the press what we can do is pre-crease all of the programs so when it's time to fold them they'll fold along that line and you won't get a buckled edge and it'll just make life a lot easier. This is one of the advantages of using something like the Heidelberg Platin Press is that you can also do die cutting and creasing and perforations and some of those other aspects of printing that don't actually involve ink and traditional lead type. Once all of the pages had been creased, then it was just the task of sitting down and folding them one by one into little piles. Here I'm using a bone folder. Uh, it's not actually made out of bone, but the original ones would have been. I'm very happy with my plastic one. It did the job.
once all the sheets had been folded, then there was just the task of sitting down and assembling them all together, ready to be bound. Next, I took a bike ride and a ferry over to Birkenhead, where I visited New Zealand Fabrics and Yarn, and I bought some embroidery thread in purple and olive, as well as some Japanese sashiko thread. And uh, these we'll use for the binding. By the time we got to the binding, the print shop at Motat had been closed for some maintenance, uh, so we brought everything home, which is fortunately a step that can absolutely be done at home. So I set myself up at the dining table, and uh, once I figured out a system, we started to work on the programs together. We did somewhere between a little over half uh, in the purple, and then the remainder in the olive. It was a nice little project, we had some snacks, and we had some X-Files on the TV, and the cat occasionally coming along to see what we're up to. It was a nice way to spend um, the evening, it felt like it w we thought it was only going to take a couple of hours, and I think in the end it was about uh, eight hours of sewing to do all the programs. And then suddenly, without warning, we had some almost finished programs. These are pretty much good enough to go, but uh, there's one step that we will do if we can. At this point we're only a couple of days away from the wedding and the print shop has been closed for maintenance. Fortunately it opened with just enough time that we were able to get in and Dennis was able to guillotine the edges of the program for us so that all the edges were neat and lined up perfectly with no extra bits that they didn't need. So now we've got some finally finished programs after three months of working on these solidly and then suddenly here we are at the wedding. I didn't get any pictures of handing them out or people enjoying them, uh, but they did go down a treat. Well, how it's best to me as a minister and as a marriage settlement, I'm now honoured to pronounce you married. <laughs> You didn't think there was everything though, did you? As you saw earlier, I used a lot of type in this project. Here is one of the drawers that I used, uh, quite empty of different pieces of type. So of course what I need to do is put everything back again. First we need to do is to take out the coins and the furniture, and, uh, and then out come the regulars leaving us with just the type to go back into the drawer. And of course it's important to put things away and keep everything tidy as you work. So here I'm putting away some of the furniture, and then putting away some of the riglets. As each letter came out of the drawer one by one, they've all got to go back again one by one. And it's really important that you're accurate at this point because if you put things in the wrong cell when you're putting them back, the next person to go and throw in comp will pull out wrong letters. And given that there's a good chance that it'll be me or Michaela, it's really important that I do it correctly. Um, this actually is, uh, you get through a lot quicker than you think. So it took about three months to comp and set the text and it took uh, only a couple of weeks to, dis it, to disassemble it and put it all back away in the drawers, clean and ready for the next person. And ta-da! It's all been put away and the drawers are full of type again. Great opportunity to reflect on how great a project this has been. It's really stretched me as a printer as well as making something that I'm going to cherish for the rest of my life. <laughs>